dues. Um, we sent an email yesterday with the team's contact information. As a courtesy to others, please remain on mute when you're not speaking to reduce the background noise. Staff may mute you if there's a lot of background noise coming from your line. You can mute and unmute yourself using the small button at the bottom of your screen that looks like a microphone. Uh, please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button under reactions at the bottom of the screen um, to ask a question. Another option to is to enter your question in the chat box. Before beginning the meeting, I'd like to recognize the work group members who are on the call. So I'm just gonna call out your name and then if uh, you don't hear your name, uh, feel free to um, introduce yourself at the end. So I have uh, Dr. Dugarala, Aaron Davis, Jeff Bernstein, Karen Lamb, uh, Matthew Celentano, Matt, uh, Dr. Barr, Dr. Kana, Nora Hoban, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Conway, uh, Senator Lamb, um, let's see, William Henderson, and William Johnson. Did I miss anyone on the call? Okay, so I will now turn the meeting over to um, the MHCC Executive Director and Work Group Chair Ben Steffen to make opening remarks. Oh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Melanie. And uh, it's been a few months since we uh, last met, but uh, we are continuing to uh, develop the plan. Uh, I wanted to be sure the work group members uh, were aware that we have made uh, several presentations uh, to organizations uh, participating in the Medicaid program. Uh, in uh, earlier this summer, uh, we presented to uh, the MCOs and uh, more recently uh, at the um, last uh, MAC meeting, uh, the advisor, Medicaid Advisory Committee, uh, we also provided an overview of the uh, progress we've made in developing the plan to date. Uh, as well as uh, Mary Jo Condon provided an overview of what was being done in other states. So I think we're uh, building a momentum. Uh, keep in mind, uh, as you all know, that we're developing the plan right now. Uh, the objective uh, is to have that plan uh, submitted to the legislature and uh, th with the uh, ultimate goal of having uh, a program uh, in place and measurement beginning uh, in in uh, 2024. So uh, quite a bit of work yet to do. Uh, we'll have a number of uh, recommendations we'll be putting forward uh, to the work group today. Uh, but the, the first step will be to uh, get a uh, an update on recent primary care investment uh, efforts uh, across the country. I think Mary Jo is going to uh lead us uh through that discussion is that correct yes okay take it away all right thank you so much ben uh, good to see everyone this evening uh, we wanted to start with a bit of an update on some recent state and national primary care investment efforts and then also uh, talk a little bit about how the work in maryland uh, aligns with what we're seeing in other states so uh melanie if you go to the next slide there has there has been a lot occurring across the country uh, on primary care investment. So here's a list of states. You'll see there's eight states listed here. Um, three of them actually passed legislation this year um, to define primary care, report on primary care spending. One of those three, Oklahoma, also now has a target that it's Medicaid MCOs spend 11% of total spend on primary care in four years. So they have some time to meet that target, um, but that is the target in front of them. Um, there's a couple of other bills that are, I'll say moving um, and may actually be circling back next year, but they did not pass this year. So, or have not passed yet this year. So in Massachusetts, uh, really interesting legislation there. Um, it's called Massachusetts 
primary care for you. And it uh, not only increases primary care investment, but also uh, makes a significant expansion in prospective primary care payment, moving more of the market there to capitation. Um, and it also requires um, practices adopt what it calls primary care transformers, which are essentially new care capabilities. Um, so that one's moving, uh, but is actually also expected to come back next year. Um, North Carolina interested in convening a primary care payment reform tax force, so similar to this group and similar to this group interested in measuring primary care spending. Um, there are a couple of bills that are just sort of languishing. So in New York and Pennsylvania, um, primary care report spending task force um, sort of bills that are just sort of sitting there, not really moving through committee, doing what they need to do to pass. And then in Vermont, there were actually three bills that did not pass. Um, so uh, each one of them aimed to increase primary care spending, set a defined requirement for primary care spending. Depending on the bill, those requirements ranged from 12% to 15% of total spending. Um, interesting, you know, Vermont has had a arrangement with CMS for some time now. It's really focused on an ACO model. Um, this was, you know, it focused on increasing the percent of spend specifically dedicated to primary care, but those did not pass. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see here that states that are sort of a little bit farther along the continuum are also publishing more reports. Um, <clears throat> so in Connecticut, um, interesting report um, out of there, there was a 5% investment target. Um, most payer types did meet that 5% target, but not commercial. Um, and so they've now actually increased the target to 10% by 2025. So we'll see what happens there. Um, over uh, down the street in Delaware, um, its annual report finds carriers project compliance with the 2023 primary care spend requirements. For 2023, that primary care spend requirement is 8.5%, um, but it's only measured um, on um, providers that are doing care transformation. So you have to be sort of doing certain types of activities uh, to be included um, in that spend analysis. Um, and then separately, um, the state has issued a policy brief that discusses sort of all of the market factors that are complicating efforts to increase primary care investment and transform care delivery. And we'll talk about some of those on a lessons learned slide in just a couple of minutes. Um, Virginia um, has also updated measurement results, including measuring primary care spend by county, which we actually don't see in a lot of these other reports. So that's an interesting look. All right, if you go to the next slide. So here are those lessons learned from other states. I think one big one that's really highlighted in that Delaware report is the need for multi-payer alignment. So four of five states with primary care investment requirements only focus the requirement on either commercial or Medicaid, but not both. Oregon's kind of the outlier in that their requirement applies to fully insured commercial, state employee benefits, and the state's Medicaid uh, MCOs, which they call CCOs there. Um, and this lack of multi-payer alignment can be complicated because you know if you have 10% of total spend coming in for commercial, um, but not having sort of commiserate levels of spends across payers, it puts primary care in a tough position. Do you, you know, offer certain services for some um, patients that you don't offer for others, or sort of how do you um, how do you uh, work within that from just a day-to-day -day implementation perspective um, without um, treating folks differently or having on um, the flip side sort of, um, you know, certain individuals subsidizing the care of others? Um, it's also difficult to transform care delivery when you're only receiving the increased payment on a subset of the population, um, and that's particularly true for small providers. Um, and then difficulty reallocating spending um, to fund primary care investment in the short term. So what do I mean by this? So I think that states are really trying to think about how are they going to fund um, this increased investment. Um, so in two of the states, Rhode Island and Delaware, there is a price growth limit for hospital services. Um, in other states, there's no defined offset. 
Um, and so you have to think about, you know, where will the money come from, um, especially because it can take time for the savings from um, improvements in access to primary care to accrue. And then this last one is a little bit technical, but it can be very important, especially as more of the market moves to alternative payment models. So determining how to account for risk settlement payments in primary care measurement. So for example, let's say that you have a hospital system and they performed really well on their arrangement as part of an ACO arrangement. And they earned you know, several million dollars um, back from that. Well, it's possible that some of those dollars went to support primary care, um, likely not all of them, um, but how much do we really know? The carriers don't have that information and the carriers are the data submitters. Um, and then also these payments are retrospective. So, you know, often by six months or more, which complements, complicates reporting and accountability. So if you have an investment requirement or target, you don't really know how much was spent during the time period. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, I also wanted to just take a minute to share with you some national work um, that is occurring at ARC, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So they saw all these states around the country measuring primary care spend. And like we've discussed here, they noticed that there wasn't one way that states were doing it. And so ARC um, commissioned uh, researchers at Oregon Health and Science University to do some research on what is the best way um, to measure primary care spending. So um, they're gonna be producing a technical brief. Um, they're gonna talk about what are the methods and the estimation methods that are used across states. Um, what data sources do states use? Is one method or approach proving to be better than another? Um, and then they're going to try to assess whether or not a standard measure of primary care spending could be identified. So I think this is really interesting work um, for states to be watching um, as they think about sort of, you know, how their definitions may evolve over time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So we want to shift here for just a minute um, and talk with you a little bit about how the work in Maryland um, is progressing first, and then also how it relates to um, the best practices that we're seeing nationally. So um, as I think you all know, and has been mentioned a few minutes ago, um, MHCC is preparing a report um, to the governor and the General Assembly that will include an analysis of primary care investment, um, but it's really a plan um, to talk about how they're going to sort of do this work going forward and informed by the primary care work group, which is all of you. Um, the plan establishes the primary care investment analysis framework, so essentially the approach to measuring primary care spending um, that will guide MHCC in this annual assessment of how much is being spent on primary care in the state and then also identifying the policy issues um, that the work group and other stakeholders should consider. So over time, this plan will be updated each year and will evolve to reflect the primary care landscape. And so as all of you have been meeting um, over the last several months, um, it's really informed the development of that plan going forward. And if we go to the next slide, I wanna sort of talk through how that's been so well aligned um, with these national approaches that we're seeing in other states. So one is you're all here. I think one of the real best practices that we see in states is that these plans are developed with multi-stakeholder input. Um, and also that definitions are informed by and aligned with previous state and national efforts. So um, as you all may remember, um, much of the Maryland definition is really built off of a definition that was developed by five states previously. And then we made some tweaks and adjustments um, so that it could be updated and reflect care delivery in Maryland. Um, you all has, have also discussed, and David's gonna share in a few minutes, that sort of the current thinking on the reporting strategy is that you'll show both spending in primary care in dollars, so how much was actually earned by primary care providers, and also as a percent of total medical spending. And so by reporting on the, the data both ways, we can track how much in actual dollars 
our primary care providers receiving? And also, how does that compare over time to healthcare spending growth that we're seeing in other areas? And I think there's been a lot of thoughtful conversation around this sort of virtual table about how the approach to increase investment needs to, one, manage cost growth that could potentially come from that increased investment, um, but also that there's differences across payer types um, and that those should be reflected um, in um, the measurement process as well. So with that, I will turn it back over to the team. So uh, let's, okay. before we begin uh, the next presentation, are there questions for Mary Jo? So uh, I have one, uh, and it gives David a little time to prepare, uh, catch his breath. Uh, so you mentioned Medicaid and and uh, commercial markets. Uh, Maryland's kind of unique in that the the Medicare population in Maryland has has had an access to an advanced primary care program. Certain payers. You know, care first and others have had primary care initiatives in place. Are there states that are, are successful in uh, folding Medicare in? Now, uh, we haven't talked about making uh, care primary, which is the new um, CMS program that includes Colorado, North Carolina, New Jersey, uh, New Mexico. Uh, and then we have a couple states that begin with uh, M. Minnesota and Massachusetts uh, and Washington. I think I might have left out New York. But uh, other than that, uh, are there other states that have figured out the magic sauce of incorporating Medicaid into their initiatives? Uh, incorporating Medicaid. Medicare, rather, excuse yeah, me. Okay. Yeah, Medicare. Medicare. Um, in different ways. So it really depends on the state. So some states like Rhode Island, are sort of heavy um, CPC plus previously now primary care first state. So that's sort of how they've tried to engage with Medicare on this. Um, in Delaware, Delaware has actually one of the largest per capita concentrations of MSSP attributed members of any state in the nation. And if Tyler's on, he can fact check me on that, but I know that that was the case a year or so ago. Um, and so, you know, each state sort of does it in their own way. Um, I was at uh, a conference last week um, with actually some of the MHCC colleagues, and uh, one of the, the final presentations was from a person at CMMI who noted that they're interested in creating a new multi-payer model um, that will aim to uh, increase primary care investment. So I think that they're... Um, there's a lot of discussion around exactly how you sort of uh, work on this on behalf of Medicare, although I think Maryland's in a really good spot, right, because it already has MDPCP, et cetera. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? And Ali, if you'll watch uh, for hands raised too, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but I don't see anyone. Yes, Thanks, Michael. One quick one. Mary Jo, on the ARC report, is there any timing that you know about in terms of when that's expected? Because they've done reports before. And so I'm just curious what they expect and when in terms of additional insights. Do you have a sense? Yes. So I know that they are working on it now that they, um, I believe, are hoping to have, they have like a group of internal advisors um, that I believe they're hoping to send it to soon. I would think by the end of the year, Michael, but I don't know that for sure. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, I think we're now ready to move to the, really the next step uh, in our work towards uh, developing a set of recommendations that can be sent to the legislature in uh, December. Now recall that, uh, and we have uh, the bill sponsor uh, among us today, uh, Dr. Lamb, also goes by the name uh, Senator Lamb for uh, a few months of the year. Uh, we're uh, 
instrumental in uh, really elevating the importance of primary care through legislation passed uh, two years ago, uh, Senate Bill 734, that uh, required uh, uh, the MHCC to convene a primary care uh, work group and develop a mechanism for reporting on uh, primary care spending in the state with a special focus on uh, improving quality and access to uh, primary care services, uh, focusing in particular on healthcare equity, reducing disparities, and uh, avoiding uh, uh, unneeded uh, healthcare utilization uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, the first, uh, the the recommendation report is due in December uh, with us, with the Healthcare Commission, uh, then uh, responsible for issuing the first report a year later. Uh, it's uh, essential to keep in mind that the folks uh, in this meeting uh, play a very essential part in defining, shaping, and ultimately implementing these objectives. Uh, we have developed some uh, thinking on directions that the work group might want to take, and David Sharp's going to walk through uh, the set of uh, draft recommendations uh, momentarily. What I would ask David to do is we want to have the most uh, productive and fruitful discussion we possibly can. So um, as you present, the recommendations will pause uh, uh, for a manageable amount of time to get input from the work group members before proceeding on. I think uh, each of these is important and they deserve uh, consideration individually. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Very good, and thanks, Ben, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as noted, 2023 is intended to be the plan year where we've developed the approach for how we move forward. This evening, I will talk about five specific elements that uh, is a reflection of the nine prior discussions this work group has had. Um, we think the discussions have led us to um, a staff recommendation that, as our executive director noted, um, we'll seek your uh, input on and uh, we'll pause after each one specifically. Um, Allie, can we advance the slides? Go to slide three. Sorry, it's Melanie, but the, is it moving on your screen? It's not moving on my screen. It's not moving on anyone's screen. So. Okay. Well, Allie, can you seize control? Yeah, hold on a second, David. Okay. Can you guys see it? We can. And who is who is Allie? Are you at point or is this Melanie? It's Melanie. Is it moving now? Uh, it is not. Try going to slide three. Why don't you, uh, since, this, since this, this isn't working, why don't Allie, you try to present the slides? Yes. Sorry, everyone, just one more moment. Perfect. Okay, so there we go. Um, so, as you might recall, states with initiatives. Oh, wait a second. I don't think you're at the right place. Are are you on slide three? I can't tell for sure. Yeah, uh, I think that's slide three right there, David. Okay, very good. I can see it now. As you recall, states with initiatives aimed at strengthening the primary care delivery system characterize primary care using narrow and broad definitions. Narrow definitions usually include general practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and a core set of primary care services related to primary care in offices and outpatient settings. Broad definitions typically expand on the narrow definition to include some combination of other providers, namely obstetrics and gynecology, behavioral health, and clinical social workers. The providers include and services performed typically define whether a definition is narrow or broad. 
States sometimes use both narrow and broad definitions to measure and report on primary care. Based upon the conversations that occurred around the definition, um, staff concluded that the work group favored a definition informed by other states and regional collaborations. The Maryland approach encompasses office visits, preventative care, and a broad set of other services when performed by family medicine, general practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, geriatricians, NPs, and PAs. This includes providers employed or under contract with a nursing home, an FQHC, an urgent care center, and a retail clinic. Behavioral health services are included when provided by a primary care provider or by a behavioral health provider when the billing provider has a primary, has a primary care taxonomy. Obstetrics and gynecology services are part of the definition when performed by a primary care provider. So based on workgroup feedback, staff recommends a Maryland definition informed by both broad and narrow definitions. And with that, I will pause for um, commentary from our executive director or, or Mary Jo, and then questions from any of the members. Yeah, I, I don't have any specific uh, uh, comments on this. I think uh, I'd like to hear if there are particular, if there are uh, any concerns from the work group uh, about included or excluded uh, categories of providers. Dr. Conway has her hand raised. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, ask a question about urgent care centers. I remember us having a uh, discussion about this and, and, and I think looking at the data, but including that in the primary care spend, I just don't recall the, um, the, the rationale for, for where we landed on that one. So Ben, do you want to weigh in or Mary Jo? So, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I recognize there was some discussion about that. I think that uh, both urgent care centers and retail clinics uh, do uh, provide uh, options for primary care services. Uh, I think there are some concerns about the fact that it uh, can lead to siloed care. Uh, but I think the benefits of counting uh, services delivered at these sites, uh, in my mind, outweigh the benefit, the cost of excluding uh, that category of service. Uh, we have to recognize particularly uh, the evolution of, of um, retail care, be it delivered at a CVS or Walmart or uh, other retail site that increasingly the public's finding uh, this type of care uh, uh, accessible and, and desirable. Uh, if it can be linked, uh, I think it's, it can be demonstrably uh, valuable. So I think that's where we, we as a staff ended up. Mary Jo, do you have any uh, additional comments or want to remark on what other states are doing? Uh, sure. I can just say that it's it's a little bit split depending on the state. There's no sort of one common way um, that this is done. I think that to Ben's point, there has been a shift um, in care delivery where there is more primary care being provided at urgent care centers and retail clinics. And I would also just um, emphasize that it's still only the care that meets the CPT code list. So for example, if there is a service that is not a primary care service that is performed in urgent care center, that would not be included. So it has to meet all three of the conditions in order to be included. And um, I think I see Chad, Chad's hand up. Good afternoon, Chad. Hey, David. Hey, everybody. Um, I have a comment on a slightly different issue. Do you want me to provide that now or do you want to stay on that thread? Um, if it's on the slide, I think, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, we can maybe circle back to this question, but if you okay. wrap this up, so go ahead. Just, it, I, I like the Maryland definition. The only thing I want to point out is the second sentence, this includes providers employed or under contract. Um, is that a requirement that they need to be employed or under contract or simply that the service was, you're trying to say the service was delivered in these settings? So are you saying, you know, concierge? 
I, what maybe you can be a little more specific. I just I don't know the phrase employed or under contract seems unnecessary to me because I don't know that that's a requirement of what you're counting. You're I think you're just trying to count those primary care services delivered in these particular settings. I, I think you're right, Chad. Yeah, I think we could just simplify it. I think that's a good yeah, it's a good simplification. Okay, thanks. Dr. Lamb. Dr. Lamb. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess two or three questions here. One, the first one is just a procedural question. This definition that we're looking at here, this was the what the staff recommends, which is what's being shown above that, is the consensus kind of definition of, of the worker product, right? That's, That's where this is coming from. Okay. Um, second point um, is I know that we mentioned preventive care right at the top of that top line. Um, I would ask that uh, especially a preventive medicine also be considered as part of the special T's that are listed here, given that preventive care is, is you know, kind of part and parcel of preventive medicine. So, you know, just a, a consideration of that to be added to the list of specialties. Um, I see Chad's giving thumbs up too. Um, last point, um, unless you have anything you want to add on that, David, Ben? No, I, no, okay. I, I think, uh, you know, that, that's acceptable to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, last point, um, going back to the bill itself that created this, this whole effort, it does list um, other non-physician providers that are also not nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. For example, it lists um, primary care uh, midwives, um, and those aren't specifically listed here in this definition. I don't know if there's a if it's implied to be part of, um, you know, some of these categories are already included in here, or um, if it was intended to be included included somewhere else, but um, the bill itself actually listed, you know, other providers beyond just NPs and PAs and MDs. Um, so, you know, however you want to capture that, um, want to put that back out there too. So, like midwives, for example. Yeah, I I I think that the way we would view you know, without changing the the staff recommendation is that nurse midwives uh, that are part of a primary care practice would be uh, obviously included. Uh, I recognize there are a few nurse midwives that are private practice or attached to a to a obstetric OBGYN practice. I don't think that the current definition would include that um, those. Uh, providers when they're uh, engaged with those practices. You know, certainly this is still you know, proposed, but open to further discussion and thought on that. I think if, obviously, if, if you included midwives associated with a OBGYN practice, you would be hard pressed to justify uh, including nurse midwives without the without also including the uh, OBGYNs. But I think in a primary, attached to a primary care practice, they would be included. Yeah, the codes would be captured. And I think, um, uh, Dr. Lamb, did that answer your question? Or do you have a third one? Yeah, I think that answers the, the question. Let me think about that a little bit more, but I um, appreciate the response there. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the rare, but you know, perhaps uh, evolving case is, you know, increasingly we've tried to give non-physician healthcare professionals greater autonomy. Um, um, we don't see, you know, that many nurse practitioners opening up uh, practices um, in Maryland. Uh, there are some, but um, you know, definitely uh, the question of nurse midwives is one that uh, is a, a little tricky. I mean, just to posit this out there, I'm obviously not an OBGYN, but I think there are some private OBGYNs that um, probably engage in primary care of some sort for their patients too. So, you know, I think, um, you know, there's just something to think about. And I think some of those OBGYNs may feel like, you know, it's not being recognized that they're being left out, but you know, I think it's something to think through. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, so, one of the commission, um, one of the work group members on the spot uh, who's actually operated as both an OB uh, and a primary care provider, Dr. Connick, do you have any? 
perspective on that? Yeah. Um, so in Maryland, there are really no primary care practices left that do obstetrics. The last few were in Garrett County and they ended up um, shutting down. Some primary care physicians do um, prenatal care, but as far as I know, midwives are not hired by uh, primary care providers. And like Ben said, once you bring the midwives into this picture and you try to include pap smears or something done by them, then it really opens the door for ob gyn So either we leave the entire class out or we take the entire class in. All I don't think it can be a halfway. And midwives have to function as a midwife under um, the guidance of a uh, ob gyn who actually does the deliveries and things. So I am- That's actually not true. Do you know any who work with a primary care doctor? I don't know. No, I mean that there are no, the midwives do not need to function under a physician. They need to have a collaborative agreement with a physician, but they do not need to like work for right, or right. under a physician. Collaborative right. agreement, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. correct. But that's not even required in, in state, like years ago, midwives were required to have a collaborative agreement signed and by like approved by the state of Maryland, but that's no longer required. We just have to like, as part of our professional integrity, we need to know that we have a physician that we can call if we need a section, if we need a consult, right. anything like that. But it's not, um, yeah, so just. Right, so what you're describing is the difference between the way NPs practice and PAs. So the midwife role is more like an NP. So they can Correct. be more independent, but in and Maryland, they can. Right. In Maryland, the NP owned practice, I, I only know of one, uh, which is out on the Eastern Shore. And those, there used to be an NP practice, a pediatric NP practice in Baltimore. Um, I don't know if it's still there. I can do a quick web check. Yeah. Right. They're scant. They're yeah. very few. And, and I think overall, the discussion about midwives, and I know Clarence brought it up with some thought. I really think that including midwives would really open the door for a lot of complications with bringing in OB and, and the role they play and how much is PAPS and general preventive service because they really don't do the more general diabetes and hypertension and all these things. They don't do that. And, and I think that you know, we're not saying that it's not important. I think we're trying to get a, a definition of primary care that we really can uh, measure, wrap our, our hands around that there can be general consensus on. Um, and I recognize that you know, there are going to be differences uh, as we you know, move towards uh, the, the edges of primary care delivery. But uh, I think I want to emphasize, it's not that we're dismissing any category of service through this exercise, but we are trying to get a manageable definition of primary care so we can measure, expand, and improve uh, on the service. So uh, I know that uh, William Henderson from HFCRC has raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Lamb and, uh, and uh, Ms. Mete have uh, also had their hands up. I don't know if you still have questions, but we'll, I'll go to William first. Uh, thanks, Ben. So my question is on that sentence that lists uh, nursing home FQHC. Is that implied to be an exhaustive list or is that meant to be examples of sort of non-traditional settings that were included? I As think that it's intended to on there is, is a hospital-based clinic. I, uh, I think a hospital-based clinic we would want to consider for inclusion. Uh, I think that this is not necessarily exhaustive, but what it does show is uh, each of these we've talked about um, in some detail over the course of the several meetings we have, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, and you know the 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 uh, hearing is still open on what else, as Dr. Lamb you know offered 
uh, others' potential um, entrance. And yeah, then, I, mean, I just wonder if you should stick, you know, and other, you know, non-traditional settings or something like that in, in, in that phrase, just because it was, I wasn't sure if it was trying to be exhaustive or not. So noted, uh, Dr. Lamb, uh, and then- yeah. Uh, back. Thanks, Ben. Go ahead. Um, I, I guess, you know, going back to the to the prior question, I think the um, to me the question really is: Do we consider women's preventive care as, you know, primary care or is it really specialty care? I'm obviously not the you know women's women's health expert here, but you know, and, and would be open to others' thoughts or opinions on that. I guess personally, I lean to think in the direction to think that it's more, you know, primary women's care is more primary care, just like preventive care is. Um, and, you know, the other part of that, too, is that, the, you know, the statute itself, going back to read the statute, it explicitly lists, uh, you know, primary care midwifery. So, you know, I think there, this was a consensus document as well, obviously, like any piece of legislation is, but that was included in the definition that was actually in the statute itself. Uh, Sally Ann. Uh, so a follow up to Dr. Lamb's question uh, about in, in the context of FQHC. So we employ nurse midwives and they provide both prenatal care and they end up being the primary care provider uh, for those women. And so I my question was, how do you account for then and and deal with the primary care that they provide um, in, that, in that particular setting, the FQHC setting, uh, which I understand is you know, different uh, than many other of the settings, but um, I you know it, it's, it's increasingly uh, becoming a larger part of what we're doing, particularly because of you know, fewer number of OBGYNs, particularly in rural areas or highly populated urban areas. Uh, noted. I, I think you know, we might make a tweak here and say that uh, um, obst obstetric and gynecologic service, primary care services uh, provided by a nurse midwife uh, when that uh, individual is employed by a primary care practice or FQHC could be counted. That would be you know, sort of a simple suggestion that I think might, might capture that. Uh, remember, we are you know, talking about a definition. One part of it is provider type. Uh, the other part of it is the categories of service that are provided. And I think we can we can uh, delineate that. So we're not simply taking everything um, based on a provider type, but but rather uh, part of the definition is a uh, taxonomy code. And the second part of that definition is uh, the procedure codes that are performed. Mm -hmm. And Mary Jo, I think you had your hand up. Um, yes, I, I, well, I was just gonna note that, you know, um, the what's here on the screen are not the full technical specifications, right? So, so there's a, a long list of codes that includes, you know, many types of clinical nurse specialists and nurse practitioners and other members of the care team that um, are sort of referred to here in in various ways, but not um, directly. And so, I. I also want to highlight Dr. Bernstein's point in the chat, um, which is that that you know there was some discussion on this, and I think that the thinking during that previous discussion was that it was going to be really difficult um, to identify and sort of portion out um, the care provided by midwives um, under uh, a primary care practice. It's possible. We can certainly try. We can look for a primary, we can look for a midwife taxonomy and look for a primary care billing provider. But I would also caution us against having a definition that's too difficult to explain or implement. Like to just sort of think for a minute about the trade-offs here between, you know, ease of implementation and what you're really going to gain from adding that, which it sounds like from the discussion, you know, these sorts of arrangements may occur, but they're not terribly common. 
Thank you, Merjo. One last word from uh, Mete. Hi. Um, so I wanted to bring up the fact that we had talked about the OB GYN, sort of the GYN services. And I do think that we are treading on some difficult, sort of some thin ice if we're not including pap smears, mammograms, like annual primary preventative care that is needed for women throughout a large percentage of their life. Like if we're not including that in our primary care definition, I find that a little suspect. Um, and at least in the like city area, most primary cares are not really doing the, the pap smears and things like that. And so there, there is definitely a component of primary care that is done in a GYN setting. Um, and I would also argue that as if we're going to say that this is not an extensive use, like we're, this is not everybody who is considered primary care, then we need to put something in that language where it says, you know, general practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, NP, PA, et cetera, or something, because certainly midwives are providing a significant amount of that primary care to uh, that like women's health primary care and, and, in the state of Maryland. And Ben, can I just make interject a comment here? Sure. Um, I think um, as William Henderson suggested, he proposed a friendly a tweak and Ben thought it seemed to make sense, Mete, that would get to your point. But I would also note later in the slides at the very end, uh, we shared some of the specifications and you mentioned, for example, there's several, a couple slides on OBGYN services. And by way of example, the uh, pap smear that you mentioned is included on the list of services. So we didn't, we didn't forget it. I think it's just as Ben noted and Mary Jo noted, we're high leveling it here and you know, as we get further along, there, we provided more detail around the technical components of it in the slide deck. Does that, in, so, cause here we're sort of focusing on where those things are being done. So it's happening in an urgent care or an FQHC. Are we, when we talk about those services that are definitely primary, in my opinion, definitely of a primary care need, are we saying that, okay, well, if those are performed outside of a primary care office, they are still counted as primary care? We wouldn't count them if they were delivered by a GYN practice. So, so I, and I guess that's where I'm concerned because I don't think a lot of that primary care is performed outside of GYN offices. I don't have the statistics on it, but I know as a provider, the, the amount of when I see patients in the office, it is a lot of primary well women visit. And so I think we'd be losing. I think we've gone through this you know, a fair bit. And I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I think we're starting with a, you know, a, a baseline definition. Uh, this is the first step. Uh, the recommendation report goes to the legislature if they uh, and the governor, and then we, in the next year, implement a report based on those definitions. Uh, that is to continue, and I think as we gain more experience, learn from uh, what other states are doing, uh, I can say that the definition you know would would evolve. But some of the questions that are being raised here, we can look at it in a little further uh, detail um, as we you know, put move forward with the report. But what I would suggest is, uh, you know, I think I know Sally Ann has her hand up again too, uh, that I would like to move through all five of these today. Maybe we come back, come back and can talk about this further or we have a broad overarching discussion at the end. Because I think you have to see the five concepts together before you say, no, 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 you got it wrong here. Uh, I think you have to view the definition in totality uh, before you make a judgment uh, on thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, I'll pause here and I know Sally Ann has had her hand up for a minute or two. So uh, uh, last one before we move to number two. Well, I just make a suggestion, Ben, <clears throat> is 
when I'm looking under the in the Maryland section, uh, this includes providers employed under contract with a nursing home or FQHC. Maybe there's a way to treat the FQHCs a little differently in that context because we are primary care providers. And you know, other than perhaps some specialized behavioral health people, midwives and everybody in there is doing primary care work. Prim and I think that gets to the services. Yeah. That, that Mary Jo keeps has calling our attention to. I mean, I think we in an earlier meeting discussed, you know, cardiologists are providing primary care, endocrinologists are providing primary care. Um I think you know, we want to start with a pretty a standard definition of the primary care specialties and then build out from the, from there based on you know what we think is missing i i do worry if it's um if it's too broad what we're actually measuring becomes very difficult to to define and and you know, part of this is is uh, an objective of understanding how the primary care workforce is to be expanded uh, and uh, enhanced. And if we uh, operate from the perspective of, you know, virtually every internal medicine uh, specialty is delivering primary care, I think we dilute the the objective of elevating what would be considered. Uh, the principal primary care specialties from the visibility uh, that I think is generally believed uh, we should uh, we should uh, grant them at this stage. So Ben, do you want us to move on along? Yeah, I so we'll we're not you know we're tabling this discussion. I think it could crop up at the end, but let's go forward with number two. All right, uh, please advance the slides. Okay, um, the work group as it relates to investment target options uh, through discussions seem to favor a voluntary target, which engages stakeholders in a collaborative process and inspires a shared commitment. It's less likely to hasten overall cost growth because payers can adjust the pace of increased primary care spending. The drawback to this approach is that it may result in slower progress in reaching primary care spending goals. On the other hand, a required investment is more likely to result in achieving care spending goals. The drawback is that it's more likely to increase costs. So based upon the prior discussions from the work group, staff recommends um, a voluntary target for each payer type. And well, David, a little, could you expand a little bit on our thinking on that? I think, you know, sure. Sure. Shouldn't we have a shouldn't we have a firm target? Doesn't that give something uh, a target that everyone can aspire to? What's the advantage of a voluntary target? What have we learned from other states? Sure. And um, Mary Jo, please feel free to jump in. The, the the basic thinking is that payer investments, which we saw from some of the data, um, carriers are at different points in play with their investments. And some are, are ahead of others and some lag behind. So the idea here is to uh, move people along slowly through an incremental process, um, but eventually keep moving people along and not set a target where some payers would say, oh, well, then we really don't have to do much because we're already at that level. So um, it's more important to be able to say you know, by category type. And what we've heard from other states and some other organizations around the country that are doing this approach is that a, a target for each payer type um, tends to be more favorable and it creates more equity in terms of progression towards an overall investment. And Mary Jo, is your, your, please correct me if you think I'm incorrect. No, I think that's absolutely right. I think that, you know, and we're gonna talk in a few minutes about, you know, sort of how that target might be structured. Um, but there are differences in populations, there's differences in, in where folks starting point is. And so um, at least having the opportunity for a target for each payer type, um, you know, gives, uh, as, as David said, you know, a reason for everyone to be sort of rowing in the right direction and, and moving along. And um, yes, agreed. Dr. Uh, Girola, go ahead. 
Yeah, my, my concern with having different <clears throat> targets for different payers, I know there's different populations based on the payer. Some payers may have more younger populations than other ones or more complex patients. But my concern is um, <clears throat> that if we have different targets for each payer, there's going to be a lot of confusion about why some payers have a slightly higher or lower target. And that may cause not just confusion, but also um, perhaps um, some arguments or, or disagreements that some payers may say, well, why is theirs so much lower than ours? And I'm just concerned that that would create more friction between payers um, uh, if we had different targets. I think there might be a, a misunderstanding. So it's not different targets for different payers, like different targets for Care First versus United. It's that Medicaid, for example, offers very different benefits to a very different population. And so the target for Medicaid would be different, perhaps, than the target for commercial. And, and that's that was the yeah, Ken, uh, do you want to review what we found from our analysis? of uh, commercial and Medicaid and Medicare claims in terms of just on average, what you know, spend, uh, share of total spending uh, can be attributed to um, to primary care based on our def, you know, our definition. Yeah, in general, I don't, I know you probably don't have those right in front of you, but kind of summarize um, maybe an ordinal ranking uh, in, in terms of percent of spend and a total dollars. Um, ben, I don't have the, I, I don't have to in total dollars, but I, what I have here, you know, is. Go ahead. Um, just, you don't have, you can just tell us what you have. We, we, that will help. I think some of the work group members. So what, what on average is, are we seeing for the Medicaid MCOs in terms of percent of total spend, uh, dedicated to primary care? But I don't have those Medicaid numbers. Oh, a commercial. Oh, commercial. Okay. So, so for uh, for commercial, it's about uh, about six point three, about between five point eight and six percent. Hmm. You know, um, for uh, for commercial, um, and that is on the allowed amount. Um, they have an average PM PM about about two hundred sixty four to two hundred eighty two from 2019 to 2021. And, and that is on the, um, on the narrow definition. And uh, approximately what do we see uh, on Medicaid? Mary Jo, if you, Ken may need some help on Medicaid, we would expect the percentage to be higher, uh, <laughs> but, but the dollar spend to be uh, uh, somewhat lower perhaps. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly right. So that is typically what we see in states. And the reason for that is that most Medicaid plans tend to cover more kids than most commercial plans. And thankfully, kids are generally healthier, and so they spend less. And so that's one of the reasons why it can be beneficial to have different targets, because even the end number may need to be different. It's not as though we would try to be pitting payers against each other. Mary Jo, thank you for the clarification. That makes a lot more sense that it would be all Medicaid payers, all private payers. And then I guess we would include Medicare, original Medicare and Medicare Advantage as one type of payer. Would that be correct? Well, I, th I think, you know, in terms of the Medicare Advantage, we haven't thought about that you know, too much, but yeah, I mean, Medicare Advantage is becoming a much more important uh, payer in Maryland over the last several years now, up to about 25% of the Medicare population is Medicare Advantage, uh, significantly higher in some jurisdictions, but we haven't thought about that. I think for Medicare traditional, we would, can, we would benchmark that uh, and it can be impacted through the Maryland Primary Care Program but you know, through this statute, uh, I'm not sure we uh, will have the ability to direct what Medicare should be spending. But we do have a, a mechanism through the primary care initiative um, to do that uh, in a more um, operational way, I think. So I think it's important to report. Uh, I think uh, Matt Salentano has raised his hand. 
or did he take it down, Matt? I took it down, Ben. I just wanted to say that I think from the, the uh, commercial carrier's perspective that four and five, the staff, rec staff recommendations are probably what we would lean towards just because of the, doesn't really create a competitive um, disadvantage to any one carrier, but also rel it also recognizes the fact that carriers are doing different things of plan design, trying to incentivize consumers to use primary care more, but also to try to control and keep costs as low as possible so you can have access for everyone. So I think I just that's all I really wanted to chime in with. Great. Thank you. Ben, okay to proceed. Uh, any further comments? Right. I think you put a comment in the chat. And Melanie, can you read that for everyone? Uh, yes, uh, there were two comments. Uh, the first one, it was the concern that they're leaving uh, women out, that we're leaving women out of the definition of primary care. Um, I do think uh, David addressed that by saying that some of the services that were covered um, so it's covered in some of the other areas as we go through these different these different definitions. I, I think that you'll see that we are incorporating um, a lot of things that people traditionally think of as primary care that are, are women's health. Um, and then she said that I would also point out that ACNM Maryland was specifically asked to provide a midwife for this working group. That was her second comment. Okay. Um. Thank you, everyone that uh, put comments in the chat. David, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So, um, Ali, I think you want to advance the slides to in. Okay, you have it there. Thank you very much. So, um, reflecting back to some of the discussions that occurred over the prior nine meetings, as it relates to annu the annual improvement strategy, the work group favored a relative annual improvement target. An absolute target sets a vision for the future. The drawback is that they are rarely met as quickly as hoped. Additionally, it can be difficult to determine how much spending should increase each year. A relative improvement approach acknowledges that care transformation takes time. The drawback here is that it may feel less inspiring to some than a single number. Based upon the conversations of the work group, um, staff is uh, proposing that we go with a relative annual improvement target. And I can open up for questions or comments from our executive director or Mary Jo. I, I might just um, share an example of an absolute improvement target versus a relative. So it's clear to all of the work group members. So absolute improvement would be setting a defined threshold for primary care spend, such as 10% or 12%. And this would be a target, right? You know, it's not, it's not a requirement, it's a target, but it would be a defined amount. Um, relative improvement would, would instead say, let's all aim to increase primary care spend by a defined amount. So from where we're starting today, let's increase by 1%, 1.5%, 2% as a percent of total medical expense, which is you know, a much higher percentage um, on, on the actual spend increase. But I just wanted to make sure that that was clear to everyone that essentially the relative improvement target is starting from where you are today and advancing um, in a way rather than setting a single threshold. And then we have a couple of questions. Yeah, I'll... Uh, uh... Dr. Bernstein and then Dr. Garala. Yeah, just a, a clarification on that last comment. Um, when we talk about, if we take the relative, we're still talking about relative, incremental relative to the baseline. Hmm. I, I'd be very hesitant to have something where we're talking about incremental relative to the previous year. In other words, trying to squeeze out you know, more uh, from each year to be successful is is that it's still it's incremental yeah. but it's still relative yeah. to the original baseline right yes although i think the baseline may change over time as as incremental progress occurs right it would, it would keep pace yeah yeah i think uh, it makes sense to start with a relative uh, improvement uh, but I do want to ask David to explain to the group what does relative improvement mean with a voluntary uh, target? 
So that's an interesting question. So what I would say, to think of it this way, is that we we have a volunteer a voluntary target that's set at X amount. And then um, in year one, it's probably not possible for everyone to, to meet that target. So what we want to be able to say is that you are showing some improvement and we want you to reach to this point in terms of how far you're advancing towards that goal. Okay. Thanks, David. Dr. Dukirala. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, it makes sense to have the relative improvement, but since most states have that have already done this, have had, um, from my understanding, an absolute level, like they're trying to reach 12% or 14%, um, isn't there a way that we could do both, have a relative improvement, but say we want to increase by 1% every year, two years, and then have an eventual goal in five years, 10 years of reaching you know, whatever we set it at, 14%, 12%, something like that, um, because then we have an actual goal to get to. Um, my other, and sorry to piggyback on this, going back to the um, uh, primary care investment approach of voluntary versus uh, required, um, I am a little concerned about that if it's voluntary and there's no incentives or disincentives for reaching those goals, um, that the payers will be, um, you know, uh, incentivized to, to get to those goals. What are the incentives for them to, to, to go try to get to those goals? So that was my one concern about it being voluntary. So Mary Jo, do you want to share with Thank you. Uh, well, let's get Dr. Barr first and then uh, turn to Mary Jo. I don't know what Dr. Barr, you know, may you have. I'm going to throw out at you. Is that what you're about to say, Ben? Yes. No, actually, I'm um, covered my point. I thought it was, uh, it, by, by listing on the absolute improvement that that sets a vision for the future, you're not acknowledging that the relative improvement is also setting a vision for the future and an ultimate goal. So I hardly endorse what Amar said in terms of combining the two. And I was interested in the answer to the second question that you brought up. So I'll stop there. All right. And now uh, we'll turn to Mary Jo. Um, yeah, so so you certainly can uh, combine the two if, if that's what the state decides. Um, I will say that one of the reasons why relative improvement is recommended here is because what states that have done this before have found is most effective is um, actually to sort of stair-step investment increases. So for example, although Rhode Island is an absolute improvement now, it was actually a relative improvement goal for many years before it ever became an absolute improvement goal. Um, in Delaware, um, they started with an absolute improvement goal of 12%, and honestly, no progress was made. And so what needed to happen was they needed to put in sort of stair-step levels um, to get folks sort of moving along. Because what can sometimes occur is the absolute improvement goal just looks too big. It looks sort of like too much of a jump. So just wanted to add sort of a little bit more context to some of the history and of how other states have pursued this. So I'd, uh, uh, I'd like to get some other people's uh, comment. I, it, you know, setting an absolute goal is, um, you know, I think there are, but recognizing it's going to be accomplished in stair-step manner does seem to be beneficial. It's consistent with the analogy that I use uh, that worked well by saying um, within the decade, we're going to send a man to the moon and return him safely to the earth. You know, having something very concrete uh, is, uh, you know, mobilizes people, but emphasize that it's being going to be accomplished in an incremental way may be the best of both worlds, but I'd like to get you know people's thoughts on that. I'll start by um, uh, asking uh, Dr. Connor to raise, she's raised her hand already, so you want to comment, and then we'll go to Senator Lamb. Um, so I guess I wanted to say that, you know, I think we've been waiting a long time to get to this point. Uh, it has been through multiple iterations of patient-centered medical homes, you know, PTNs and whatnot, trying to demonstrate MDPCP now, trying to demonstrate the value that primary care brings to the overall healthcare system. And I completely appreciate uh, what uh, Matt said about the fact that everybody has a different target. 
But I think setting some sort of goal is probably a good idea. And it, it, I don't think anyone thinks that we're going to go from 5% where we are, below 5 to 10% overnight. So setting an incremental process to get there seems to make more sense. Um, and each insurer would then have the ability to put forth their specific needs. I, I think putting some sort of goal with this esteemed group of individuals would make some sense. I believe that would be a good move. Uh, doc Dr. Lamb, do you have any comments, any thoughts uh, as you are the sponsor and also a practicing uh, primary care physician? I think you would have you have some view on this. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ben. I didn't I didn't have my hands up, but uh, I know. happy to, sh <laughs> to share some thoughts. It's the chair's prerogative. To <laughs> to well, uh, thank you. I'm glad I got called out. So, I mean, my thoughts, I guess, are that I, I think you can combine, you know, these these together in, in some fashion. I think, you, you know, Ben, you were describing it a little bit earlier that was kind of approaching this anyway, which is that, you know, you, you could have an absolute target. And really, if a if a carrier can't, meet that absolute target, at least they have something to show to meet, you know, a relative goal. Um, so, you know, I think there's a way to be able to kind of bring bring some of these together that shows some meaningful improvement, you know, in, in, in any of the circumstances. So, um, you know, just something to think about. Uh, Sally Ann, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I'd like to advocate for a hybrid. I, I think it's important to have an, um, an absolute um, target, but to uh, build steps to achieve it um, incrementally over time. Um, I, I think it's important for, in order to see how you're moving through the incremental steps, I think it's important to see what the overall goal is. And recognizing that from time to time there there may need to be adjustments, circumstances change. We need to go back and rethink. But I I think, you know, knowing that it's twelve percent, and but we're going to, you know, do this in twenty percent increments over the next five years, um, is fine. But I think we need to see what the overall target is. Thank you. Matt, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, I know you didn't raise your hand, but you did, did raise your hand. I just did. I had a feeling you were calling call, call on me, Ben. Uh, I have a couple thoughts. I mean, sort of general in nature. I, I think that after doing this for a long time on the consumer side and the industry side, I've become sort of a ra radical incrementalist. And I think that there are a lot of unknowns here. And my uh, tendency is to lean uh, to agree with uh, the recommendations also with, with Dr. Senator Lamb is that we are going to be adjusting this as we move forward. I think there are a lot more factors than just what other states have done, considering with the, the total cost of care model, and also that we've started to look at value-based payments and primary care in the commercial market, something that is sort of not even really started yet. And there are a variety of factors that are going to sort of change the outlook from the carrier perspective, but also in the way that we try to keep people incentivized in primary care that are unknowns. And I think that um, I know that Senator Lamb being in the General Assembly is not going to let this go. And we are going to be revisiting this year over year. And I think that um, to me, that makes it even more of a case that we should start um, start small and continue to build as we learn over the next couple of years. Thank you. Ben, could I just ask Matt to clarify? I thought I heard you start out by saying the, the similarly to Sally Ann, a hybrid approach, but then I think you ended up by saying, if we start small, let's just go with relative improvement. Yeah, I think the relative improvement is where I'd be leaning, David. Okay. And Ben, did you want one more comment from Sally Ann or do you want us to move forward? Sally Ann, is your hand still up or do you... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't lower my hand, but I do. I, you know, I have a, another thought. So I've been working in value-based care for, since 2014, uh, in some form or another. And 
uh, one of the lessons I've learned, which is sort of a backdrop to my comment earlier about the hybrid method, is we started out with, with incremental goals. And I found over time that people really needed to have what the ultimate target was. We were constantly having, going back and having that conversation, but saying, you don't have to do it all in one year. Uh, we're going to do this incrementally, but knowing what the big picture was and where, and where we were ultimately heading for seemed to work better. So that was the basis, my experience is the basis for my comment. Thank you, Sally Ann. Thank you. Uh, I, I haven't heard from the hospital association. Uh, Aaron, do you have any comments? Ben, thank you for calling on me. I don't at, at this time, I'm filling in for Laura, so I'm still kind of catching up, but thank you for calling on me. <laughs> Uh, others, particularly those who you know, haven't commented, just be forewarned. Okay, I think we have some general, uh, not unanimity, but general consensus that uh, we ought to think about a hybrid approach uh, with a strong flavor for emphasizing that uh, any target would be achieved incrementally. I do think that as if this is to take root, uh, eventually we will move towards a, a, uh, an, absolute, uh, an absolute target, but I think the idea of uh, emphasizing incremental uh, improvements is a way to not paralyze uh, payers and others who may have concerns uh, that it's going to be done in one uh, giant leap forward, which is, I think everyone agrees, that's probably not going to work. Okay, I can uh, travel along then. Um, Go ahead, David. Next slide, slide please. Should be investment calculation approach. Okay, so um, Mary Jo sort of covered this in, in her uh, opening presentation, but I'll just cover it here again. Uh, so everyone gets a better vision of it. Um, again, we uh, went to uh, the discussions, back to the discussions of the work group, and it, it seemed as though the work group favored a per member per month as a percent of total medical expense approach. A percent of total medical expense is consistent with other state approaches and messages that increased spending on primary care should reallocate rather than increase total spending. The drawback is that it does not recognize differences in total cost of care across states. A per member per month approach is easier to reflect the cost of achieving primary care delivery goals, sustainability, and efficiently, and is consistent with how payers typically measure healthcare costs. The drawback here is that it may not resonate with stakeholder audiences unfamiliar with the per member per month calculation. Based upon the workgroup's feedback, staff recommends a per member per month and underscored as a total percent of medical expenses. So it's the it is somewhat of a hybrid approach. And I can pause there for comments or questions. Uh, any any comments? So why don't you give the work group uh, you know, an example, David, of what you're talking right. about here? So um, Mary Jo, I think you summarized it best earlier. Can you just reiterate your point? Sure. So what this is saying is that when MHCC calculates primary care spending, they would look at it two ways. So one is as a per member per month amount. So they would take all the spending on primary care and divide it by the number of member months um, that existed. So for example, if I'm a member of a health plan for a year, then I get 12 member months. But if for some reason I started in a new job two months in, then I would only have 10 member months. And so typically, you know, current day, that number is probably around, I don't know, 25 to $30. Um, and then MHCC would also um, convert that per member per month amount 
to a percent of total medical spending. And so when you read some of this primary care investment you know, reports and they say 10% of total spending, essentially MHCC would also calculate that type of a number. And the reason for this is really that um, we want to know both whether or not absolute primary care spending is changing, but we also want to know how it's changing in the context of total medical. So for example, if primary care spending is going up 10%, but total medical spending is going up 20%, then that gives sort of new context to that 10% increase. So Mary Jo, we've talked about the um, relative improvement. Uh, how would that really fit into having a, um, a calculation approach that uses both? Uh, are we going to tell people that we want a 2% improvement over baseline? and a $100 growth in primary care spending. What does that mean to maybe to help the, the, um, the uh, and no chat, it doesn't include uh, drugs uh, right now, I think. We That's right, it excludes drugs for the moment. Um, so I think one thing I would note is that, you know, just because you're calculating something a certain way doesn't mean that that is also your goal. So what you may want to do is set your target to say, we're going to increase primary care spending 1% of total medical expense each year. So let's say we're at 6% right now. Let's aim for 7% next year and 8% the year after that until we, you know, until you reach the number that you think is the right number. Um, it would, in my mind, just sort of knowing how the numbers work and how, you know, total medical expense and primary care expense can move around. I think that's likely a, a better approach for setting a target is to base it off of the percent total medical expense. That's really consistent with how other states do it. But I still think it's important to measure the per member per month amount, because you still want to keep an eye on it, even if that's not where your goal is. Right. And I think that it, you know, doing measure, actually saying we're going to use both metrics does uh, prevent, you know, situations where uh, primary or specialty care is reduced so dramatically that primary care doesn't actually in, increase but the percentage, because the overall total spend, the clients. Now, <clears throat> that may be sometimes uh, really valuable, and you know, a lot of people would be good, happy to hear that. But I think having the two metrics together gives you a better idea of the why uh, of something that's happening. Uh, any comments? Then Nora Hogan has her hand up, and then Dr. Bernstein. Nora, yeah, I go ahead. Sure. I was just going to say out of out of all the recommendations, I think this is the most straightforward one and is very intuitive. Um, so I I just yeah, I hopefully we can move through to the next stuff. But this seems very straightforward and um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, uh, I, I mean, I think I agree that combined makes sense. But one of the concerns and maybe I just don't get it conceptually is, is there a difference in these methods? of how non-claims, non-fee-for-service spend is, is included or reflected? Because I think you know, we had some discussions, is that significant or not? And uh, conceptually, I'd be concerned, is that not part of the per member per month type analysis? So, so um, there's no difference across these two approaches in how non-claims payments would be handled. So uh, I believe that the current thinking is, you know, the department is just starting to bring in non-claims payments. And so it's going to be a little while before we're able to include those in calculations of primary care spend. But that being said, once those are included, they would be included under both of these approaches, and they would also be included in the numerator and the denominator of the percent total medical expense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh. seeing no further comments on this question, and taking uh, Nora's comment as the uh, final statement from the work group, uh, I think we should go to the fifth recommendation. Um, so, next slide. 
So um, the, the calcul I think then we've actually hit all of them. Oh, the we've next covered them? Yeah. The next slides would be on the data that some questions have already discussed, but I would ask for your consideration since we are nearing the, the top of the meeting hour. Um, is it okay if I just sort of note the couple of slide, the couple of recommendation categories, not in detail, but where staff would go back with the executive director's uh, uh, blessing and we would make some tweaks to the recommendations and that would be on slide four, which is the investment approach, we heard considerable discussion around um, the different types. When is, is things like midwife services included and what services are they? We would make it clear. We also have talked about adding preventive medicine because I think there was a question regarding preventive care. And then we wanna make it clear that nurse uh, midwives, if they're practicing in a primary care setting, um, and they're using the taxonomy of the of the primary care provider, those services are included in the analysis. And then also that to uh, Mr. Henderson's point about the second sentence includes providers, make it clear that this isn't that there could be others, but these are this, these are the objectives at this present time and that the plan would evolve uh, in the future. And also uh, to a point, uh, raised by the FQHC about the services are more in the direction have evolved into primary care services quite a bit. And then on slide six on the annual improvement strategy, there was considerable discussion about um, looking at a hybrid approach um, as opposed to one or the other. And our, uh, our chair noted that um, it did seem to make sense to have uh, in the plan, the goal being to identify what the improvement target should be, and then allow for relative improvement over time. So it acknowledges the notion of the, what Mary Jo mentioned about transformation takes time and it doesn't seem like it's out of anybody's reach. And if we just strive for an absolute improvement target, it doesn't appear that we're making progress because um, as Mary Jo noted, they seldom are met. And um, those were the, the the largest change we changes noted, uh, we did keep uh, the, the recording so we can go back and in the event that we might have missed something, see if we pick it up. But from the staff recommendation slides, these would be the categories that um, received what we would call the modifications. So um, then back any, to- any, uh, So David, you mentioned you had two slides you wanted to cover. So we have a couple data slides if they're in can if we could indulge the group for just maybe five minutes more. And I would invite um, Ken to um, talk us through these slides. He mentioned a little bit about this earlier on, but um, if you want to just cover these slides, it would be great. Sure. Thanks, David. Good evening, everybody. So um, so this these slides, uh, this this exhibit uh, depicts the the primary care investment, um, looking at it from a percentage of uh, primary care as a percentage of, um, of total medical spend, and also um, from a per capita spend, which is uh, the PMPM annualized. So um, this is based on the narrow definition that was uh, discussed at length earlier. So, um, so one of the takeaways that we could see here on, on the first, the first uh, set of, uh, of results on, on the top table uh, and, and the first um, four columns, we, ha we have the primary care spending as a percentage of total. And we could see that uh, there are some variations uh, across, um, across years, Insigna having uh, the highest uh, percentage and um, Aetna having the lowest percentage across years. Um, when you go over to the, to the right, staying on the top um, results, these are the uh, per capita spend, which, which is uh, the PMPM annualized. And, and they are about, about $23 to $21, $21 to $22. And um, we could see that um, there are some variations as well, um, you know, uh, across all pairs. Um, when, we, when we look at Care First, we see in 2019, we see that Care First is, um, is the largest there, you know, while uh, the other category, which is, which is a category that we should, I recommend that not to show because this includes um, TPAs and the state 
um, um, State Farm um, um, company, which is not really a, um, a traditional reinsurance company that provides uh, benefits for its, for its employees only. And this is a very, um, not a credible, um, a credible, um, you know, um, experience for the other categories. So, you know, so probably should not even look at that. But, but, um, but in terms of, in, in terms of these results, we see that, um, that United Healthcare in 2019 um, is at $213 and, and followed by um, Aetna uh, as the lowest at 216. If you slide over to, um, to 2020, we see that, um, that, you not, that Cigna is, um, is at $290 and uh, as the high point, as a high point. And, um, and then we see that um, Aetna at 252 um, at the lowest. When we go down to the bottom, the, uh, the bottom results, these results are uh, for the patient portion, meaning that uh, what uh, the, uh, the patient pay out of pocket, which includes deductibles and coinsurance and co-pays, and any other liability that is not a deductible or co-pay or, um, or a coinsurance, but things like when, if a patient go out of network, you will have um, balance billing, yeah, as um, as as the difference between what the uh, the provider um, um, the, the, um, charge and what the insurance company um, 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 have as a usual and customary and reasonable um, um, fee among for that particular service. So you have balance billing there and other uh, penalties for out of network. So the numerator uh, is is obvious. Uh, the per capita spending, what's the denominator, Ken? So everyone's clear on the bottom. Is that the total patient liability? This is total patient liability, yes. And the, so 8.9% means that uh, $40 is about 9% uh, of, of total patient liability in 2019 for the Aetna population. And everyone can you know kind of translate that, but the denominator, denominator on the bottom, it's not as quite as obvious is, you know, the total patient out of pocket expense. Uh, so you, you can cut, I, I'm, that's for information purposes, we're not doing anything with that. We're not proposing to do anything with it, but, you know, given uh, many primary care services are available uh, below the deductible, it's kind of interesting to see, but uh, it doesn't have any direct policy impact right now, but it's helpful to understand that. Why don't we go to the next slide, Ken? Next slide. So this is based on the broad definition, you know, and, um, and, 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 what, and what the broad definition includes is that that was uh, described on the previous um, slide by Mary Jo and, uh, and David. When we look at this, we see that, um, that there is an uptick in the, of course, in the percentages, because of course you have more, more dollars, you know, um, for the same people, you know, so, um, so we see that again, you know, looking at um, um, a Cigna seems to be um, the, the highest across years. Uh, when we look at the um, percent of primary care as a percent of total spend, and um, and 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 um, also Aetna, which uh, which seems to be the lowest, same as what we had before. You know, at five point six. You know, in twenty nineteen to five point seven twenty twenty one. We go over, over on the on the right hand side. These are the per capita spend by payer, and we see that um, in 2019, you know, we see that uh, Aetna, well, not Aetna, but United Healthcare is at 216 um, dollars. Again, the other category at 192. I don't recommend we look at that because the experience is not that credible, you know. And then um, and then we see that when we look at 2021. We see that uh, Cigna again is about at, at two ninety five, followed by Care First at two ninety two, and it seems as that Aetna is still uh, at the low point of two fifty nine. Below is is the same uh, um, you know um, display as we had had on the private on, on the previous slide where we look at the patient liability, you know, um, and we see that it's um, it's 
much is a bit larger than looking on the narrow perspective more more so than on the broad perspective because we have more claim dollars more more um, services okay uh questions so do you, do you want to go to the next slide please Thanks. yeah David take us home now yes sir um, next steps. Thank you, everyone, for your participation in the over the last little more than nine months, and for the comments that have helped us to evolve this plan to where it is tonight. Um, we appreciate you taking time to spend uh, with this work group and help guide us. This is a plan; it will evolve. I just want to keep noting that um, it isn't cast in stone, and the expectation is is as the landscape changes and more information is known whether it percolates from the group here or from what we see regionally in other states, um, staff will bring it back to the work group and uh, it will be deliberated on. So, yeah, uh, if I could just interject here, what I'd like to do is, I know uh, I wanna invite uh, work group members to comment, but give us, uh, we might need uh, a few days to modify the, the uh recommendations to reflect the opinion of the work group we would circulate that and then uh, ask for comments we'd, we'd like to i'd like to have that out before the labor day weekend uh can david give me a date when you think we could make the the slide deck available um wednesday so. yeah i think if if it's just a matter of modifying the staff recommendations that's fairly easy to do it won't take us long uh, less than we can have it out by wednesday and then we would have about um, uh, a week and a half for work group comments uh, because uh, I truly want to have this you know, as reflective of as possible of the uh, work group's perspectives before we present to the commission. And uh, we had, you know, can't schedule another meeting, but I think we can get the input we desire from uh, from the members uh, and can incorporate that into the presentation before the commission on the 21st of September. And then um, we would reconvene the work group in October to start building out the plan that's uh, proposed um, to the legislature. Very good. So uh, okay, this concludes our presentation. I yield to you. All right, um, Melanie, any last uh, steps? Uh, now, as you know, as David mentioned, the meetings uh, tentatively scheduled for October 24th, um, and we, as usual, we uh, we post the meeting summary and reporting to the website. Um, as usual, I want to thank uh, David, Melanie, uh, Kelly, uh, Allie. Uh, I don't think that I miss anyone, David. Mary Jo. Uh, Ma Mary Jo. <laughs> well, Mary Jo gets a special call out as a consultant to the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Uh, and uh, I nearly forgot, you know, the best salesperson in the Maryland Healthcare Commission's uh, suite of staff, uh, Christine Karanopoulos. And uh, I'll leave it to the work group members to ask her directly why that is. But she's <laughs> a uh, valued staff person and a valuable uh, salesperson as well. Uh, and Thank lastly, you, I want to thank all of the uh, work group members for staying with us and giving us an, an additional 12 minutes uh, tonight. Um, expect to get a, uh, a refined uh, uh, set of, of recommendations midweek. And if you can have them uh, back to us by, uh, what should we say, uh, the 10th of September, would that be good? <laughs> so the 10th of September, um, I think that's a Sunday, so I think we want to look the, at the 11th of September. We'll okay. give people the weekend uh, after Labor Day. So if you can have any comments back to us by the 11th, that would be great. Uh, we can incorporate them into the presentations for the commission on the 21st. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, that, everybody. I appreciate your attention throughout. Good discussion. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye now.